Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor Tom McKenna, and with me this episode are Executive Art Director Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. Special Projects Editor Matt Kinney. Hello. And our web producer Ben Strano. Hello. Oh. Way over there. And uh, helping behind the scenes, as always, is Jeff Rose. Before we get started with the questions, I have to take care of some business. This podcast is brought to you by Minwax Wood Stains and Finishes. Whether you're bringing old wooden furniture back to life or building a future heirloom, Minwax allows you to create a piece you'll love forever with easy-to-apply wood stains and durable protective finishes. With a wide range of colors available, from traditional wood tones to custom decorator colors, there's a color to fit every project and every home. Not to mention that feeling of personal satisfaction when you step back and look at a beautiful piece you created yourself or for your family. Learn what made with love, finished with Minwax, truly means at minwax.com slash made with love. All right. Hey, before we get to the questions, actually, um, we just received our latest issue, number 257. It's the December 2016 issue. Um, Chris Bexford, contributing editor extraordinaire, is on the cover, making a standing desk. The um, cover with the white background, which was a one-off, but it's now going to subscribers full time. It's a it's a permanent off. Yeah, I think that's the official term, permanent off. But um, we all worked on some some cool articles in here. I worked with Craig Thibodeau to put together um, an article on a miter clamping. Sled, a miter cutting sled, I should say, and Chris, uh, Chris frame, Craig for a, it's for frame miters. Frame miters, yeah. yeah. Craig and Craig does uh, amazing work um, out in San Diego, and he uses miters all the time. And he had some great tips, not only for cutting them, but for for gluing them up. So that was um, a really fun article to work on. Matt worked on uh, a few others too. Uh, <laughs> I don't really remember. I, 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 do I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember, I don't remember boss. <laughs> uh, I do. Uh, let me look at the wall over here, which people can't no, see. No, that's, that's the wrong, the wrong issue. issue. Oh. Uh, uh, I worked on buying, oh, how pros buy lumber, how lo- yeah. pros look at lumber, uh-huh. which is a cool article where I talk to like 10 or 12 people and ask them what they think about when they select lumber for a project. It's not about, you know, calculating board feet. It's mm-hmm. about... What qualities in the lumber do you look for? How do you think about lumber overall uh, when you're designing? And there's some really fantastic information in there. Um, otherwise, I'm sure I worked on other stuff. I just don't remember what it is. Chris Gochner cut a bridle joint. Oh, yeah. I did yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was it, Matt. That was it, this issue? That was it. Yeah, it's all right. up, man. <laughs> there was that one time I did five articles <laughs> in the one issue, edited five, but... It's hard. One of the things that's interesting about working here is that uh, you're just constantly working on articles and departments, and it kind of becomes a blur. And so yeah. you don't really know, you don't remember, like, oh, that's in that issue or that's in this issue. Right. You're just like, I got to turn this in. Yeah, that happened. Oh, and I think uh, this uh, issue's designer's notebook, Five Takes on the T Box. You handled that one as well. That's with our yeah. contributing yes, editors. Yes, I did all edit that. Yep. Made a tea, we set them a T packet. And said, build it. And said, make a box that but, this fits in. Yeah, so Chris Bexford, uh, Raleigh Johnson, Steve Lotta, Garrett Hack, and Michael Fortune all made a tea box and uh, to hold tea packets. In, and in a way, they were all sort of mini self-portraits. <laughs> they really were, yeah. It's pretty funny. <laughs> they are, yeah. Perfect examples. You could you could easily identify who made which one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So. How about you, Mike? Any thoughts? Uh, Andrew Hunter did a really cool, um, really easy to make a Japanese style toolbox just out of pine and nails. Um, I've actually used that. I've actually made, I think, three since this thing came into the magazine. Mm-hmm. And they are really neat. They're really fun. Um, and they look cool. Yeah. What's interesting about Andrew is that he, I mean, He's not just making a Japanese toolbox. I mean, he uses Japanese tools all the time. He builds a lot with traditional Japanese techniques. Uh, so, But then he has a set of blue-handled marbles chisels. Yes. Like, that's it. Those are his <laughs> chisels. It's like, really? All right. But they're super sharp. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, hey, I know we uh, Matt mentioned lumber, but it's something that we, we wanted to talk a little bit more about Um how people choose lumber. It's a it's a really cool article, and you get a glimpse into. I think there's at least ten um, 
solid makers um, showing off their furniture and giving great tips on how they shop for lumber. Um, and Matt thought it would be fun to talk about that today. Uh, so you lead the charge, my friend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, did you know? No, I'm not. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> not this record. <laughs> uh, yeah. So actually, Ben talked me into going to a local lumber yard, and we shot a short video that is a little bit about how. Well, that video is about how I look at a stack of lumber and quickly identify which boards I want to see. So, I mean, one of the ways that to think about lumber that's not about calculating board feet, because really, personally, I find calculating board feet and cut lists not very helpful when I'm picking out lumber. I mean, you do have to have an idea of how much wood you need. That's true. But the things, you know, like when I'm looking at a stack of lumber, what I look at is I look at the ingrain, for example, to identify are there any boards that are quarter sawn, rift sawn, are they flat sawn? If it's flat sawn, is there a nice wide section where the grain is uh, mostly rift? Um, and it lets me uh, quickly pick out boards that, so as I start to dig through the stack, I'm not wasting my time looking at every board. I sort of know I want to look at these four or five, and then I can look at those more closely. Um, but, uh, there, I mean, there are other things that, you know, you think about when you're selecting lumber, you know, and I, I think about, you know, like uh straight grain, quiet grain. I even think about things like, you know, am I going to be able to find, because I use cherry a lot, and cherry has these nice little often tight pitch pockets or streaks of pitch. And I think about the location of those little pitch pockets and such, and, you know, where could I locate that on this lid panel or on this door panel to uh, make it more attractive? And so uh, those are the types of things a little bit that we're talking about here in this article, but it's also the kind of thing I think that as you master or you get better at joinery and uh, you get better uh, and you have all the tools you need, because those are the things that people really start thinking about when they start making furniture or woodworking. They think about what tools do I need and how do I do stuff? But once you sort of get that under your belt, you can start thinking about design. And one of the things you have to think about with design is lumber, mm -hmm. you know, and what aesthetic qualities do you want in the lumber that you're going to use to make a particular piece? Yeah. And you had mentioned um, your preference for sort of quiet, straight grain. <clears throat> and in the article, a lot of these makers, and they're all top, top makers who make beautiful furniture. It's, it's a, amazing how many of them often were looking for that straight, quiet grain too. And that almost seems like the antithesis to like studio furniture, one-off, mm -hmm. really eye-catching stuff, but how everybody is often looking for the not the wild grain, but just something that reinforces the lines of the yeah. piece. I think that's a really important thing. And also how to a person, and this is what you were alluding to, it's sort of like wood becomes a really important and considered factor, you know, for every single piece, the grain, the grain direction, the color match, the type of wood. Right. Um, and the, the, I think the more you get into it and it's not something that's difficult or overly expensive to do, but I think it's one of those things where if you turn your attention and you're mindful about how you use wood, you can make the simplest furniture, a little shaker side table or something, and it can be a stunning piece if it's really yes. considered. Yeah. 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 And this is the, the thing about good design, which it starts, it starts at the lumber yard. You yeah. know, I mean, you've designed a piece of furniture and it's got good proportions and, and good lines and so forth, but you really do have to pick the right lumber for that. And you have to be very deliberate and thoughtful in, when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. It but can't even, be happenstance. But even if you're making um, a project from a plan or like reproducing a period piece, you still have to have that same <clears throat> the same considerations as you go to the lumber yard in terms of yeah. what you're choosing for yeah, every, absolutely. every uh, nook and cranny. So right. um, it's funny. I buy, <clears throat> I tend to buy lumber when it's available. I buy a lot of kind of what maybe used lumber from, from people who are selling their shops. And I've got a stack of wood that I use, but it's funny. I, I'll use a lot of that wood. Like I've got a bunch of maple and walnut and it works fine for some of the simpler pieces I do, but um, I'm finding 
as I as I advance more in my woodworking that some of those boards just aren't going to work for what I'm for what I'm making and so I've I've got I started collecting spalted boards for drawer fronts and things like that so yeah. it's sort of I'm starting to get more and more into that um, better grain selection for particular spots but it is a, it's a it's a good learning curve to master for sure yeah, it's, you definitely have to eventually you have to tackle that. I've seen a lot of furniture that is otherwise nice, but it's just killed by grain selection or, you know, a poor choice of the species of wood mm -hmm. or a poor choice of using figured wood where you should have used unfigured wood. Yep. Things like that that are just uh, can be absolutely brutal. Yeah. Uh, and just ruin a otherwise nice piece. Right. And Mike buried uh, a comment about the, the cost of it. You know, it doesn't cost much more or if at all to, to be more careful and to not rush at the lumberyard. Right. So. Well, that's a point that in this article that John Reed Fox makes, which is really good that um, – and John Reed Fox uh, is not – uh, bashful about saying that he really pays a lot for his lumber, and he does. He pays. He goes and finds the premium stuff. But you know, he points out it's just the same thing with hardware. If you're going to spend you know forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, or more hours making a piece of furniture that you're going to have in your house for the rest of your life and maybe for your kids' lives, why would you balk at spending an extra one hundred and fifty, two hundred bucks on lumber? Yeah. It's like, it just doesn't make sense, you know. Do it the best that you can. And do the same with hardware, mm -hmm. you know. Do, get the best hardware that you can that is right for the piece of furniture and use it. And then you'll have something which is really phenomenal, you know. Good advice. Yeah. All right. Let's get to uh, some questions. Let's start with uh, one. Comes, the first one comes from John. And John asked, what is your take on nail guns in the shop? Would you get battery or air-powered? I have air-powered. Um, I don't know why you would get a, a battery-powered gun unless you were using it in other places other than your shop. Like if you're doing a lot of trim work, if you're traveling, if you're doing like built-in installs on the road, then maybe battery-powered might be cool. But um and I, I use them quite a bit. The two I use the most, um, I use an 18-gauge pin nailer for usually like a lot of jigs and that kind of stuff, popping things down. And then for furniture work, I tend to use, what is it, the 23-gauge? 23, 23 is the standard. Yeah. They've Now though, there's been like uh, some kind of standard 21-gauge. Yeah, I have a 33-gauge. <laughs> you can't see the nails. <laughs> No, the 23 gauge, they're, they're really fine pins with no head. They leave almost no entry hole. So I'll use those if I'm putting in um, like a glass door and the little backing uh, sticks behind the glass. I'll pop those in with a pin nailer. Um, I'll often just tack in backboards with a little pin nailer or the brad nailer. I, they're great. I use them a lot. For jigs and stuff, I prefer the fatter 18 gauge with a head because when a lot of times you're like popping sacrificial boards off or temporary pieces off the jig and the bigger nails with the head pop off with the work piece right. where the 23 gauge, they tend to, the piece comes off and you have all these little stickers of nails sticking up. That some of you, they have to break them off or, or try to pull them off without right. them breaking. And yeah. so... Yeah, that's the same. I have yeah. a 23 gauge and a uh, 18 gauge, and mm. those are the ones that I use the most in my shop. Um, and I mine are definitely uh, hooked up to a compressor. Uh, you the, you know, when I started buying them, they were simply the uh, other types were not readily available in those sizes. Now there are in the smaller sizes starting to yeah. become these either battery operated or in some in some way powered by something other than compressed air. Yep. Um, and uh, we just reviewed one by Grex in a recent issue, not the one that just came out, but the one before that, I believe. Um, and uh, but the mine are definitely compressor, and you can get a, a nice compressor like the one that I have by Roll Air, which also I reviewed in the magazine, which makes no noise at all. Yeah, and <laughs> it's small, it's light. And uh, you can use it, and it's more than enough for furniture work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just not a, an issue to have a, com, uh, a, com, a small compressor. You don't have to have a giant compressor to use a, yeah. you know, a, a 18 or 23 gauge. Yeah, that, that's my thing. I have uh, I have a 23 gauge uh, air powered 
nailer. And I don't use it because I hate my compressor. It's just too loud. I can't stand turning it on. So I'll do anything but to use this nice gun. But I think I'm going to invest in one of those quiet compressors that, that Matt, you, you did the review, right? Yeah. Yep. So that's what I need, something quiet so you I can take advantage of this thing. Know that four out of five oh, woodworkers believe <clears throat> that uh, spraying yourself off with a compressor hose is just as hygienic as taking a shower? <laughs> All right, let's get to question number two. This one comes from Doug. Um, that's your stat of the podcast. Well, thanks. Yeah, we've been waiting for that. Um, the Doug, fi- Doug the, fi- the fifth one thinks it's actually more hygienic than taking a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Doug writes, "I am building a box to hold our beloved Great Dane's ashes." The box is made with some very beautiful spalted maple sides, a Baltic birch bottom, and for the lid, a piece of cortisone walnut. The walnut lid will be glued into the sides and slightly proud, set in an eighth-inch rabbit on the sides. Should I worry about the walnut expanding enough to rupture the miter joint sides? How should I handle this since the box does need to be sealed to prevent the ashes from flying out? Well, that's not what he says, but I, we think that's what he means. Uh, and the answer is the box does not need to be sealed because when you get these ashes back from <laughs> the uh, like little veterinarian, they had better be in something better that is airtight. Something. Yes. Yeah. They need to at least be in a Ziploc bag, but they should be in some type of little can, right? Yes. Yeah, I've done something in it for someone, and in, in what came to me was in it like a little, it's like a paint can with no label, but very clean, very nice, very nice. Yeah, and very s- tightly sealed. And tightly sealed. So yes. the box does not need to be airtight um, because the canister in which the remains are is airtight. Yeah. So what he needs to do is a do the old Doug Stowe lid trick where the, at the top of the side you cut a groove and then in the edges of the top you cut a groove and those fit together like two C's, so to speak. Right. And then the top can expand and contract and uh, never uh, – it, it looks nice all the time. Right. But I think his question probably is, well, I want to make this box, put the things in, and then, like, glue the lid on. So in that case, you'd have to build the lid into the box, but you would probably just then saw off the top, put the thing in, like you – No, I think what I would do, since he's talking about a, a Baltic birch plywood bottom, I mean, I don't know the exact design of what the bottom's going to be like, but – you can glue the bottom into a rabbit well, I, I, and I do the top that way. Ooh, so the top is the bottom, the bottom's the top. And never the twain shall meet. Sure. Well, that's great. Well, yeah. so what you're saying is stick it in from the bottom. Stick it in from the bottom. And, and then, then glue the glue bottom Glue or even in. just screw the, yeah. the bottom into a, a, the rabbit, and that's not going to move. Correct, because it's wow. Baltic birch plywood. Amazing. Yeah. But a bing Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now we've got a nice home for the ashes. That's right. All right. Well, this month's 40th anniversary celebration is being sponsored by Type Bond. Even if you're not a professional woodworker, you want to use the glues the pros use. And three out of four pro woodworkers trust Type Bond as their choice. For building wood furniture or cabinets, to making picture frames or birdhouses, or just general repairs around the house, Type Bond has the widest choice of glues to help with whatever project you want to tackle. Type Bond, the right glue for your next project. Learn more at TypeBond.com or see them on Facebook. Let's move on to our next segment. This one is our all-time favorite technique of all time for this week. It's going to be a good one. Do you want to kick it off, Mike? Sure. I was uh, teaching this weekend, so I was trying to, like, rack my brain. What did we do that was really cool uh, that worked out well? There were a lot of things, but I think I probably had mentioned most of them. But then I thought about the previous class I taught, we were doing sort of a Krenov style case on stand. And this technique came about because uh, from one of my students, Keith, who's a good guy and a good woodworker, and he came up with this brilliant idea um, to help keep parts lined up for glue up. Um, I always uh, use like a cabinet maker's triangle on all of my parts to keep them oriented in the same way. And then, you know, usually they're on the outside faces of the board, but then as you surface prep everything and plane everything down, you end up making marks on a portion of an inside joint on the edge of a dovetail or inside a mortise or on the top of a tenon to sort of orient all the parts. But this particular glue up for the base actually involved multiple steps. So as you glued up the side units together, 
all of your triangles were now gone because the thing <laughs> was glued up and the leg <laughs> profiles were real subtle and it was actually kind of easy to sort of get the sides mixed up and, and everything. But what uh, Keith did, and it, it, once I saw it, I said, that's brilliant. He pulled out some blue tape, which is one of my favorite materials. And he just put some blue tape on each of the components and remarked his cabinet maker's triangles on the tape itself. So even when various parts got glued together, the parts were still marked and it was really easy to keep track of things. So it worked out well. And when I was um, making another version of this piece in my own shop, I remembered that and I pulled out my blue tape and put my cabinet maker's triangles on there with my Sharpie and it was perfect. Sweet. So blue tape. Blue tape. Because once again, yes. hey, your favorite technique. Yes. I, I should go next just because, you know, it, it's somewhat related. Blue tape. <laughs> oh, jeez. I love this stuff. Um, <laughs> the cabinet I built um, has a, a rabbit, rabbits in the back for a, a plywood panel. And, you know, when you route a stopped rabbit, you get that little, the curved who's he wants it at, mm-hmm. the, at the bottom in the corners. So in the top and the bottom, I had the, the little curvies in there that I had to remove and chisel out. So what I did is I broke out some blue tape. And so yes. I, I, <laughs> I put it down over the place that, that, that needed to be trimmed, put the, you know, dry fitted the, the side panel into place and then just scribed around it with a, with a knife, pulled out the, um, the excess and then chiseled up to the, the tape line. And it was so nice. It worked out perfectly and there was no gap, no overlap, no, it was just clean. Although I do have to say Bob Van Dyke, the, 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 uh, he, who runs the Connecticut Valley S- School of Woodworking commented on my Instagram post about this that I was using the wrong blue tape, and I think uh, I think he was right. I was using the thin painter's tape, you know, the stuff that you buy at Home Depot. It comes off really, yes. really easily. I think he was talking about. Isn't there a, th- a thicker masking tape? I, or was he just I busting? I think me? he was busting your chops. Because I thought yeah. there was because I thought there was a difference. I went and I looked at uh, Home Depot and I thought, boy, did I buy the wrong tape? He had me going for a second. However, I am in the process of working with 3M to formulate a special <laughs> blue tape specifically for woodworking, which will have my signature the Pekovich tape on the tape. So I'm looking forward to that. I believe actually <laughs> that if anyone were to seriously tell another person that they were using the wrong blue tape, it, w- it would be Bob Van Dyke. <laughs> he would be the guy to do it. <laughs> he um, did put a smiley face on the end of his comments. So. Right. Um, <laughs> well, my technique also has to do with blue tape. Awesome. I threw it in the trash. (laughs) It was awesome. Just kidding. Uh, Actually, my technique is a real technique that people can use in woodworking, Um, (laughs) as opposed to blue tape. Um, (laughs) So the last time we – the last podcast, we talked about uh, favorite tools, right? And I said mine was the Festool Domino, and I used it to make this jig to route – uh, hidden grooves in miter joints so that I could spline them and have hidden splines, right? Okay. So uh, I actually did that now, and it is an awesome technique. Mm. And I do have to give uh, some uh, props to Doug Stowe, uh, who first made me aware of this notion of doing a, a hidden spline in miter joints. Um, and uh, so I used my jig and uh, with a little uh, 316th inch spiral straight bit, and just routed uh, a little groove in all the miter joints and then made some splines also from cherry. And it's awesome. I mean, I guess the, the boxes go together and right now they're just dry fit, but they stay together dry fit. It's amazing. Cool. And uh, what's great about it is that it also registers the joint. So, and this will probably be my technique another time, but because these things register the joint, clamping a miter joint all of a sudden gets a lot easier because they're not going to slide wacky wonky, right? Right. So I made some simple L-shaped calls that wrap around the corner, kind of like the calls you would use on a band clamp. Yes. But you don't need a band clamp. You can just use a bar clamp. And it actually pulls everything together really tight because of these splines in there keeping the joint aligned. So, Are you clamping not on the diagonal, but just along each wall? Right, correct. Okay. Yeah, cool. so I, I clamp along the length of it. Yeah. And what that does is it pulls the ends down, right? But the sides, because it's an L-shaped call that yeah. wraps around the corner, the sides can't move out. So 
it just pulls everything together nice and tight. Okay. Sweet. Do you have to uh, sort of take into account the order of assembly in that you can't do like an end and two sides and then try to fit the fourth piece on because the little guys are going at an angle. Do you have to do opposite what corners fold first? Up? Like I've, fold up. You can't fold up. Can't. That's, that's, right. Right. that's why I did the L-shaped calls because you can't roll it up. With, right. like, normally I would, I would just say roll it up with blue tape, but you right. can't do that. So, um, uh, but you can, there's enough play that you can um, open, them up a little bit. open it up enough to get the, the last piece on, right. um, which is sort of how you have to, you know, there's, I, it is a little tricky, but it's, it's really not that hard okay. to, uh, to do they're that. Relatively short. Mm -hmm. Right. They <laughs> stick out uh, three sixteenths of an inch. Okay. So it's, yeah, the spline is a total of three eighth inches wide. Right. So there's only three sixteenths. And that's enough out. to yeah. give you that yeah. index. Right, the cool. index and enough That's cool. just to reinforce the joint a little bit. Yeah, uh, might yeah. is tricky. I mean, in Thibodeau's article in 257, he, he gives some clamping tips, and he reinforces his frame miters with, with dominoes as well, and so he doesn't have the, the shifty problem. But he also creates calls that he uses for, for clamping that help. For, um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different styles of calls I've seen made, and some of them are really clever. And I've seen guys temporarily glue uh, little... Uh, triangles at the corner to clamp it. Yeah. The problem, I mean, those work great on larger things. On small boxes, right. it just doesn't work. And uh, so this L-shaped call works nicely. I'll be interested to try them on a really small box that I make that doesn't have, because the splines worked on this particular box because the size are three-eighth inch thick. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about a half inch, or I mean a quarter inch, or a three sixteenth inch side, there is no spline there. You're just not. You can't spline that. Right. So um, I'll be interested to see how if the uh, if the L shaped calls will also work on little small boxes mm -hmm. like that. But really, blue tape works great on those. So uh, blue tape, blue tape, it's right. back. Well, that's a great technique, but it's kind of just a rehash of last podcast technique. No. Because no, you it's not. mentioned it no, two issues in a row now. That was a jig that I made using a domino. Now I'm telling you that the technique yeah. is awesome. Okay. So but maybe is, uh, next podcast you'll talk about glue up of this joint. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. finishing the one after yeah. that. But I have to wait for Tim Rousseau to write the article on how to do it <laughs> <laughs> so that I know what to do. <laughs> That's it. That's it. All right. Are we That's, done? All. That's all I got. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Let's uh, let's get back to uh, to the questions. This question comes from Jack, and Jack writes: uh, With all the beautiful work I see in Fine Woodworking Magazine, I never see a pocket hole method being used. Is there any reason? First of all, that's false, right? Mark we've, Edmondson we've did it. a fundamentals yeah. on using a pocket hole jig. Pocket hole jigs. Yeah, and yeah. he wrote an, an entire book on uh, pocket hole joinery, and he even built some furniture pieces using pocket holes. Yeah, we've shown pocket hole yeah. uh, being used uh, for face frames, for example. Yep. Uh, it's a great tool for that. And yeah. um, you could use it to attach the top of a table to the aprons, yep. uh, which is actually fairly common yeah. Uh, yeah. technique. Actually, yeah. in the latest issue, Bob Van Dyke wrote an article on ways to attach tabletops. And he did sort of the shop-made pocket right. hole. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to call it a pocket hole. He called it a what the sloppy the sloppy hole or something I can't remember. He, he <laughs> called it, call it a pocket screw, I think. But I, I mean, to there, a bar called that. <laughs> there is a notion that it's not to be used in fine furniture. I get it, but it does have its its place, just like any technique. Yeah, you know, whether I mean, it's a biscuit or a domino or hot melt glue. Yes. In a Mark, tape. <laughs> Mark Edmondson, tape. he's he's a pro uh, fur, a furniture maker and yes. cabinet maker, and yep. he uses um, the pocket holes for the face frames, but he also uses it for toe uses it for toe kicks, things like that. So for him, it's it's quick, and it's fast, and it makes economic sense for yeah. sure. Yes, so. I've definitely used them a lot on built-ins where I've done face frames. They're fantastic for that. Right, it's perfectly just like with any technique or any joinery method. You have to use it where it's appropriate. Yep. You know, that's the same for dovetails. Right. It's the same for mortise and tenon. It's ever all of it. Use it where appropriate. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Drywall screws too. All the time. Use those everywhere. <laughs> They're unbreakable. Uh, question four. 
is from Charles, and Charles says, or writes, <clears throat> excuse me, I was just wondering if we might be seeing the flesh detecting technology found in saw stop and Bosch table saws and other woodworking machinery like jointers, shapers, routers, bandsaws, etc. And if not, why not? Yes, we might. We might. Next question. Next. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that's that's a bigger that's a big picture thing for 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 at least a bigger mind than mine in terms of you know harnessing technology to work with those other tools for sure. It's I mean it's conceivable that other <clears throat> types of woodworking machinery could have that type of device on them, right? I mean. Yeah. Well, you brought up yesterday in our pre-production meeting that the fact that chop saws nowadays, some of the newer models have that break stop feature where as soon as you, you take your finger off the trigger, the blade just stops. Stops very quickly. So in, in theory, I mean, like I could see on a miter saw, I mean, I guess the question I would have is that, you know, we have, so we, I've used a saw stop. I've seen, I've been using a saw stop when it which was triggered, not because of f flesh, but for other reasons like metal and so forth. Drywall and, screws. Drywall screws. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of force involved. Yeah. And I just wonder, like, and, and the blade can drop down into that break. So I just wonder, like, if you were to have, say, a 12-inch joiner humming along and your finger hits it, what's the stopping action going to be? You know, yeah. how are they going to bring that colossal amount of weight and to inertia a to a halt that quickly? Yeah. And, and what are you going to have to do to the machine to make it able to survive that type of event? Yeah. And then, you know, you'd have, probably have to, oh, I don't know, re, if you have to reinstall the blades or the knives or anything like that, you know, how do you stop that, that yeah. cutter head? That's the big thing. Right. So it's not that you, I mean, conceivably, yeah, you could do this to any type of woodworking machinery, but you'd have to figure out the mechanics and the physics of stopping the blade. And each machine, like a table saw blade, the way it spins and operates is different than the way, a, you know, a 12-inch cutter head does or an 8-inch cutter head right. or a bandsaw yeah. blade it, or... It, it's very interesting. I mean, it, the, I remember we were waiting forever for saw stop to come out with that job site table saw. And, you know, we were waiting, I think it was like two years that we were expecting it and they were just constantly testing it out. And I think the big challenge from the folks that we talked to there was getting a small size saw in a little frame like that to withstand the force required to, you know, catch the blade and bring it mm -hmm. below the table. And, you know, it took them a long time to figure it out. So who knows, there may be minds working on this problem as we speak. Maybe. Well, here's my question out. to you guys. Um, Cause saw stop, I think that makes sense. I use them a lot whenever we teach, we have one in the shop. And so I don't want to have one at home, but I really want to get one. It's probably my next big purchase. So I, that's definitely something I see the benefit of, but other than the table saw, like if there were the same technology available on other machines, what ones would you most want to see it on? What machines, if any, sort of freak you out enough where you wish there was blade uh, fast sensing technology on that machine? You know, believe it or not, for me, it's the router, the my, in my, my router table, Huh? you know, because um, especially if I'm using, I find that I get more nervous when I'm routing narrow or thinner pieces where, you know, the slightest catch can, you know, disrupt yeah. your fingers pretty quickly. But I, I don't, I don't even think, to be honest with, I don't even feel like I need like the flesh sensing technology on my table saw. You know, I like, I'm, I'm pretty confident if I have a splitter there that I'm not going to have any problems, but I don't know. I would like to have a personal flesh sensing device so that I know when I'm talking to humans or robots. It goes off. Uh, yeah. Uh -oh. oh, so it differentiates between yeah, human and robot? and robots. Because okay. some of you I'm not really sure about. Uh, just <laughs> ask, but, uh, the, ask the same question twice in a row really quickly. <laughs> That's how you do it? Yeah. Um, I, the, the machine for me, see, a router table, I used to be a little sketchy, but then I realized that with small stuff, for example, you just have to figure out a different way to hold, hold it. it. Yeah. yeah, jigs and, and so forth to hold things. But... Um, the machine in the shop, other than the table saw, actually, I think the machine is even more potentially damaging than the table saw is the joiner. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you cut a finger off a table saw, you can get the finger out from beneath the table or wherever it went. <laughs> oh, your dust collector. <laughs> your dust collector. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you, you don't have that big gap, you know. It's, it's, definitely, it's on the table. And you can sew it back on. Yeah. 
But if you're running a board through the joiner and your finger runs across that cutter head, just don't even worry about it. Don't even look. Yeah. There's nothing There's left. Nothing it's all, there. It is There's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> just get to the doctor. Yeah. You just need a spoon at that point. <laughs> that that is that does will do some horrendous yeah. damage. And uh, so I would say maybe on a joiner uh, that it would be nice to have it there. Um, but again, here I'm starting to sound like one of those crotchety old men that's like good technique, and it's kind of like well. Now I never joint a board if without using a hold down and a pull, push, push stick, pull yeah. stick, or my f- fingers are always nowhere, yes. nowhere near the cutter head. Right. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And the same with the router table. I will more often than not just jig it up, get a little yeah. some yeah. hold down clamps, you know, put it on there, make sure it's a sled. And my hands are far away, especially teaching a lot. There were some things I'm comfortable doing, but not comfortable right. with other people doing. But then that level of safety sort of creeps back into my shop. Yeah. It, the uh, difference with the table saw is that, you, you know, to really make it safe in the way that you can make other machines safe with jigs and so forth is that you probably need a power feeder so that you're never having <clears> to get your hand near a blade while you're ripping. Because that's where, you know, that's... That's the, where most of the problems occur. That's, yeah. you know... The, yes, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. Because cross cuts, miter gauge, yeah. sleds of any sort will keep your hands well away from the blade. But ripping is when I think, you know, your people will rip small stock and they'll get their hands uh, close to the blade. Yeah. And to really <clears throat> avoid that altogether, you need a power feeder. And yeah. just that's just not really feasible for... No, you know, not like one-off furniture projects. No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I'm super aware when I use the table saw, but I'm uber aware when I'm jointing or using the router table. I'm like super, especially watching where my hands are at all yeah. time, you know, at all times. I'm also really aware at the bandsaw. I mean, my hand is That's probably true. closest to the bandsaw blade during normal operation than probably any, any other right. tool. Yeah. yeah, and the bandsaws are very, it's it's kind of, to me, it's kind of a fun tool to use, especially if you're cutting curves. But, you know, when you're cutting curves, it's easy to, to kind of, lose track of where that trailing thumb is, you know, and, and <laughs> no, kinda, no, kinda it's not, it Tom, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you lose that trailing thumb, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's something you have to, oh, well, any power tool, you know, right. woodworking is inherently dangerous. Yeah. So. so we don't know the answer to your question, but we talked about something for 10 minutes. There we go. <laughs> But. Ten minutes closer to shutting <laughs> us down. <laughs> well, let's move on to uh, our third segment. It's time for our all-time favorite furniture of all time for this week. Um, all right. Do you want to kick it off, Matt? Sure, I'll go. Uh, so my favorite furniture is maybe not a particular piece, but we got this book from a Japanese woodworker. And to be, I'll be honest, I don't know what his name is because I'm not sure... If this is his name, it must be uh, Suda Kinji is his name or her name. And he makes boxes, although there's other furniture in here, uh, furniture, but he makes mostly boxes. And what I like about his boxes, it's really cool. I never even thought about this. Like, here's a good example. So you, this is the box when it's closed, and then you undo this little latch, which he makes all his hardware, and it hinges. Uh, at, the, at the back at of the, the box. At the back of the box. Yeah. hinges and splits along its length. And then you have these little drawers inside that pull out. And it's just like something I never thought of before. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I took a peek at that book yeah. that you had on the table here. And I looked and I saw that. And it was this technique I had never considered. But once you see it, you go, oh, yeah. that's like really that's cool. really nifty. Little drawers inside there. And it's also, it has the advantage of also it's, it's just beautiful design. Yeah, and the, and the really workmanship is Phenomenal, yeah. yeah. And he wraps them all in uh, fabric. What is the inlay? Is that um, going around the the, rim, the middle I, of it? There, I believe it's either like metal or mother of pearl. Looks like mother of pearl from here, or something like that. And there's there's so many examples in there. I just assumed it was a collection of different makers' work, but if this was all by the same person, it's it's even more impressive. Yeah, but, it's all by the same guy. Okay. And then he does really cool stuff where, you know, like here, you pull this up. And then there's oh. trays underneath it. Yeah, that's sweet. So it's just this really, just a different way of thinking about making a box. Is it translated? It There are, yeah, okay. there's English translations. I didn't uh, see it. So here's another one of the ones that has a clasp on the front and a hinge on the back, and it opens up uh, along its length right. and not, uh, you know, with a top, so to speak. Yeah, I right. love the hardware in that. 
Yeah, he makes phenomenal hardware. Uh, it would be nice to be able to, you know, to learn how to do where, that. Where is he located? In Japan. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where in Japan. Uh, he sent this book to us. He thought we would like it. That's cool. What, it's, what it's I cool. think is really cool about that, I find that really, um, really impressive and, and amazing and somewhat inspiring. But what's really cool is that your stuff, Matt, is really sort of along these lines. And I can imagine you already sort of going down that path of really small, finely crafted objects to then see this and I could see this would be sort of a springboard to like a, a whole new exploration of that form and moving to Japan oh I would love that uh, it, it is it was in, it's inspiring to me uh, because like this box is a really good example uh, where he has this box sitting and it's sitting on a little tray mm -hmm. so a lot of times you see boxes and they're just ugh, boxes and Something that I never thought about that was uh, that uh, someone who owns a gallery said to me, she said, you know, I normally wouldn't want to have, I don't like to have wood stuff in my gallery because it doesn't sell very well. And honestly, most of it's not attractive. She said, but I'd like to have some of your boxes. And I said, oh, okay. She said, because your boxes are very artful, hmm. they're presented artfully. And that's what these are. There's, uh, there's a, something about them that elevates them beyond just a box. Yes that it's the presentation of the box itself, the way this guy conceives of what a box could be, the way he presents it, that raises it above uh, just a box, you know? And so. all the hardware looks handmade or custom made, like mm -hmm. really well considered. And I'm, I'm curious about whether he makes it himself or he has it made. Yeah. That would be a, a neat thing. If I remember yeah. correctly, he makes it himself, but I could be misremembering that. Mm. And so it's just really gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous work. And I really do like that, you know, like he shows you how he presents this stuff to people, I guess, when he sells it to them. And like, mm. here's this piece, it's wrapped in some beautiful uh, fabric, and then it's put in this amazing little box. That you box know, in a box. The box in a box. It's, it's awesome. like everything about what this guy does is so thoughtful and uh, deliberate and gorgeous. Cool. Yeah, yeah. have to get him in the magazine. Yeah, that would be nice. So, well, you guys can't top that, so let's just go. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to get some <laughs> photos from this and put it on the website so people can yeah, see it better. Right? And reference the book, where Re maybe where people can buy that. It's a... That's an awesome book. I wonder if it's a for sale in the States. I don't know. It is a very beautiful book, too. I mean, it's I, called Japanese Fine Woodwork, Pure and Refined Elegance. It's impressive. I mean, the, the, just on the, just the cover shot and the hardware. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful stuff. And I really, I mean, you take off the dust jacket and it's just this beautiful, simple brown cover. With, it's just so nice. Hmm. Good photography inside. So we should like continue talking even more about things that you're looking at that anyone listening has no idea what you're talking about. Well, you know, we should. Let's talk about your shirt. <laughs> it's a Carhartt. Yes, it, it is. It's a Carhartt yeah, what a surprise. Awesome. Yeah. How about you, Mike? Do you have uh, something uh, for us? You, you, know, like, you know you go to a restaurant, you know exactly what you're going to order, but then the person next to you orders the exact same thing. It's like, oh, I don't want to say I'll have that too because then it just looks like... Anyway... Uh, so my favorite piece of furniture all time uh, <laughs> is I was going to reference a book by James Krenov, The Cabinet Maker's Notebook. And while this book contains numerous pieces of furniture, uh, what really struck me, um, everything was sort of of a whole, like the, the work in his book, um, it was all about design, a, a specific approach design, a specific philosophy of making um, it illustrated how every surface, every edge, every joint can be considered and lends itself in a, in a very creative and personal way to the overall look. So when I think of that book, I really sort of think of it kind of as a singular piece. Um, and that's been you know, obviously really uh, inspiring, in, inspirational and influential over uh, the course of my career. And it actually kind of came full circle in that it was the first book I was influenced by while I was in college. And now, 30-ish years later, um, I just uh, built a piece for the magazine. It's coming out in an issue coming up as my my take on sort of a Krenov case on stand. So it was really nice to sort of uh, pay homage to his influence in my work. So it would be Cabinet Maker's Notebook by James Krenov. Wait 
In other words, it's a number two pencil. <laughs> 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 It's like we're getting this like this. The mic answer now is to not answer the question that was asked, but to answer some other question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'll um, I'll wrap this one up with uh, something that actually came. I, I know we're gonna I feel like I'm beating this lumber article to death, but there was a a piece that actually the more than one piece in that article. It was sort of like a reader's gallery in a way of of uh, of makers, but there's one guy in here and I've, I've seen his work on Instagram and, um, I'd love to get him into the magazine more and onto our website. But, uh, Philip Morley, I don't remember where he is from. He's in Texas. In Texas. He's not. Oh yes. He's, he's British right though. <clears throat> um, but he has this rocker in, in this article. That's just amazing to me. It's on page 57 and <laughs> I'm not a big rocker fan. Sometimes they just, they look scary to sit in, you know, some of the designs, but. I'm more of a lazy boy guy. <laughs> lazy boy. <laughs> but, um, you know, in his discussion about how he chooses lumber, it, it kind of, it kind of gives you the, um, his whole design take on this piece, but he's got really fine back slats, um, very delicate joinery, but it, it just, it's just so clean. The work is so clean. He's got an upholstered seat. And to me, it's just one of these pieces that um, I think it's it, it's top of the line um, in terms of its craftsmanship and yeah. comfort and appearance. That's a me. beautiful rock, so. rocker. It really is. I agree. I, I love that piece. I'm glad we got it in there. And I would like to get him into the magazine because other than his design work, he has a great Instagram feed. And yeah. I, it's one of my favorite feeds because um, Philip is to me he's one of the masters of coming up with processes to do things in a really efficient right. way and i i get the sense that he he actually makes a living woodworking which means he's doing sort of almost limited production runs of parts where you have to be really efficient to yeah. i would imagine to actually make money doing what you're doing so his jig setups his machine setups are always really really smart, smart. and i think that's yeah. um you know just as cool as his design work so I'm actually Great working to, on right. something with him. Right on. Yeah, he's good. He, you know, he's he reminds me of the genius that Michael Fortune possesses. You know, if you go to Michael's shop, he has jigs everywhere. He never throws anything out. But um, I think Michael has a background in industrial design, as or yeah, something design. like that. And so, you know, he thinks about everything in terms of efficiencies and how quickly can I can I make this um, and make a profit on it. And I think looks like from what I see on on. Philip Morley's Instagram account, you know, he's active and doing stuff every day and very smart. So it's, if you guys are on Instagram, certainly look, look him up and, and check out his work. Yep. Craig Thibodeau as well, who we mentioned earlier. Yeah. He does a lot of good stuff and yep. he makes beautiful yeah. furniture. Yeah. So, all right, let's move on to uh, another question. This one comes from Carl and Carl says, I recently bought about 150 board feet of spalted maple and would like to use some of it for a desk. I'm looking for possible options for a durable finish to fortify the softer, punky areas. Any experience or advice? Well, I mean, you could sort of pre-fortify the punky areas. Usually um, cyanoacrylate glue is sort of the, the thing of choice. I yeah. also think maybe like a five-minute epoxy would do a good job with that as well and probably not discolor things depending yeah. on the type of finish. Do some tests on it. I, I used it. I used a the cyanoacrylate glue on a, uh, the birch box that I, a bandsaw box that I made and just in small areas and it, it worked fine. I don't know. Yeah. I've never done it on a big, on a grand scale though. So you got to use what the Turner's, what Turner's use is a very thin formulation of CA glue, mm -hmm. uh, the, which will soak down into the fibers so that they can then turn the punky areas. Yeah. Uh, but what strikes me actually more here is that, He's talking about making a desk and using. He says he has 150 board feet, and like as if he's thinking of using the you know spalted maple yeah. to make the entire desk. And I start to think, okay, that's fine, but you have to be very make very certain that your joinery, for example, isn't mm -hmm. compromised by like soft areas. Yeah. Soft yes. areas. I have cut dovetails into a spalted maple drawer front and they tend to be a little chippy. A little dusty. Right. Yeah, a little yeah. dusty. Uh, so you either need to select your lumber very carefully uh, yeah. for your to ensure that your joinery is all in solid uh, parts of the boards yeah. or you need to save the, uh, the, 
the spalted for only a part of the desk. For example, maybe make the base out of a uh, hard maple, hard right. maple, and make the top out of the spalted maple. Right. And then uh, your base will be, be strong, and your top you could protect with a piece of glass, and you wouldn't have to worry about the punky spots because right. you'd have a piece of glass over it. Well, the top is maple, the frame is maple. Maybe you have spalted maple drawer fronts, spalted maple side panels, back panels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah, so yeah. that that would be how I would probably go about dealing with it is try and I, to ensure that the spalted stuff was in areas where its uh, compromised integrity yeah. would not be a problem. Right, and yeah. also, um, you know, from a design standpoint, uh, spalted maple is a great That's thing. striking. And there's always, <laughs> you know, the risk of too much of a great thing. Right. And that it's so striking. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a piece entirely out of spalted maple that I think is successful, but I've seen many, many pieces where certain components utilize that. It's a great contrast to oak, to maple itself. I think mm-hmm. it goes really well with cherry and, and walnut mm-hmm. because there's yep. so many varied colors within the wood that they complement other woods. But I do think... For me, that's the key. What is it complementing? What what are you bringing attention to with this dynamic wood? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm using a spalted maple on on the cabinet that I'm building, and it's an oak oak case mm-hmm. and a walnut base. And I made a a box before with a spalted maple uh, door front, and they they, would, they age really well yes. together. Um, and it's fun. But I did find. I have a big slab of spalted maple, and there are times, one of the things you have to be careful with, and I've discovered, is when you resaw parts, sometimes you'll find punky areas, you know, buried within it. So yes. it can be tricky. You just have to kind of keep pressing with your thumb or figure out where, you know, where the soft spots are. But cool. certainly be careful about the joinery. Just, just like a baby's head. <laughs> All right, question number six. (laughs) This one comes from Graham. Um, I enjoyed Michael Cullen's recent video series on bandsawn boxes. The videos made no mention of finishing the inside, which in my case was pretty rough. My question is, what do you do about that? If you sand before you assemble, you risk altering the taper and the bottom falling through or the ends not fitting properly. Sanding after assembly is not easy, takes forever, and risks a sloppy fit for the lid. Or do you simply tell people a rough finish is inherent in the method? Well, first I would say that uh, <clears throat> to minimize the roughness, because Michael Cullen doesn't really do he anything to the insides. He, I mean, he may be a light sanding or maybe hit up with a file a little bit, not really too much. Uh, but, A, you need to have a sharp blade. Sharp blade, yeah. And you need to have smooth action when you're cutting. So okay. you can't be... Don't her- stop. Don't right. stop. Don't yep. be herky-jerky. You need to have a nice, smooth cut through along that line. And if your saw is set up properly and then the blade is sharp and you have a smooth action, you will actually have a fairly smooth surface. Yeah. Unless you're using some ridiculous blade, you know, it's like one tooth per inch and the, mm-hmm. and the, yeah. and the, and the, and the set is like four inches or something, you know. Right. You, if you have a reasonable blade in there, you'll the, have a smooth... And the right size. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and yeah. you can hit it with like 220 and but, that's it. That's exactly what I did. I, I had a perfect box and I just light sanded on the inside and like one or two swipes just to take off the nibs or whatever. And it's it's cool. It's what it is. I mean, that's kind mm-hmm. of the nature of, of that bandsawn box is is the, the rustic nature on the inside, I think. Yeah, and I actually um, don't always see a bandsawn surface as a defect. A lot of times I'll work with ebony details. And, and ed, ebony can be like really like a dead black wood. So a lot of times uh, if it's a little uh, square um, pole or something like that, I'll just skim it through the bandsaw to give mm-hmm. it that bandsaw texture. And from there... You can sand it with, a, like you said, a really yeah. fine sandpaper, but then just sort of burnish it with steel wool and wax, and that's actually a nice thing. So on the interior of a box, depending on the wood, if you hit it with fine sandpaper and then wax it so it's almost like a lining for mm-hmm. the inside of the box, that yeah. could be kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, and also the other thing Michael Cullen does is some boxes he leaves natural with some shellac on it, mm-hmm. but he also milk paints the Pil- inside. Yeah, yeah. and if, maybe if you do a couple layers of milk paint and, really and sand cool. through, you almost, you know, right. highlight that bands on surface with multiple yeah. colors. Yeah, I mean, it's unless, like you're saying, unless your cuts are so poor that in that there's horrible gouges and stuff, it's not a defect. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's character. 
<laughs> well, it's it's it, like he says, it's inherent to the process, but that yeah. doesn't mean it's bad. Yes. And in, in this case. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But if you do stand, you do have to be careful of, of all the, the the caveats that he mentioned about you know, going into the joinery or, you know, altering the fit. You do have right. to be be mindful of that. What I would say is that you have to decide what you're going to do. You either are going to leave that rough surface, in which case you don't really want to do too much to it, or you're going to get rid of it, in which case have fun because yeah. you're, it's not, <laughs> the other, you know, it's, and, it, it's just not going to work. And there's also a hidden truth in here is that, you know, these boxes are not a big expense in terms of material. So I, I made a few mistakes and I just, I pitched what I, what I made mistakes with. It wasn't a huge um, expense in material. So if you, if your surface is too rough, maybe you want to try it again. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, the sharp blades set up bandsaw yeah. in a smooth action on your cut will minimize the amount of sort of Certainly. unattractive jaggedness, and you'll just have an attractive variation in the surface. Yeah. It's kind of a cool tactile feature to the inside of the box, too. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Tune in again in two weeks on October 28th for our next episode. Remember to send your questions and comments to shoptalk at taunton.com. And please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your woodworking friends and neighbors. You can catch the podcast via iTunes, stream it on the web at shoptalklive.com, or catch us on iHeartRadio. Also, don't forget to visit findwoodworking.com to keep up with the tool giveaway for our 40th anniversary. The current prize is a new concept six and a half inch coping saw. To win, you must enter by October 17th. To enter, go to findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. That's the number 40. Again, that's findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook and look for all of us on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening and have fun in the shop. So helpful. <laughs> ben loves this podcast thing. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to talk like the teacher. No, I can't hear Matt at all. Yeah, because I'm muted. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Click. <laughs> You're done. <laughs>